<laughs> Unfortunately, it's not always like that. <laughs> so, I didn't want to come to this talk. And I'll be honest with you, I tried every way of getting out of it. But Hazrat Mawlana Zakaria, I'll be honest with you, but Hazrat Mawlana Zakaria Sahib, Allah Ta'ala bless him. His figure and his love pulled us here. Allah Ta'ala give us all the tawfiq to value our elders and our ulama al -kiram. It's only when you travel, you go to other places and you find that there are not dynamic personalities in the locality and how the locality is dead. To arrange a gathering like this, to call people, it's not easy. So we should honor our ulama and honor the opportunities that Allah Ta'ala has given us. Allah Ta'ala has blessed us with Iman and Islam, that's the greatest gift. Tonight is a night where all over the world, not just in this country, but even in Muslim countries, people will be engaging in the most nefarious and disgusting, despicable, despicable acts and losing their Iman, drifting away from Allah Subhanahu Wa On a night like that, Allah Ta'ala has blessed me and you to come and to sit in His house, in His path, listen to his talk. So Alhamdulillah brothers. It's a great blessing. This shows that Allah Ta'ala wants to endow us more and bless us more. We have the gift of Iman which is worth more than a billion, no, a trillion, no, sextillion Bugattis. A person becomes a king of the whole world but he does not have Iman. The Bodhisattva or the youngster with a scraggly beard and the walking topi eh? and the dirty socks, the simpleton. That Molisab or that youngster, that practicing Mukmin, Muslim, is still better than that person who's got the whole world but he does not have Imam Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa once told the Sahaba Kirana story. He said a woman was sitting by the roadside from the past nations. She was suckling her child, breastfeeding her child. And by and by, a person rode by on a horse. And it was a beautiful pedigree horse. And the person's clothes were really posh, very debonair. And he looked the part, he looked rich. So the, every mother wants the best for her child. So the child, so the mother looked at the man and like we do, when we see the dunya, what do we say? Oh, man. Ya Allah, please, make me just like him. We do that when we see somebody of dunya. Ask ourselves, when was the last time I looked at Maulana? I looked at a Hadi Sahib in my masjid who is always there. He struggles to come to the masjid, but he's always there in the first half, always performing salat. Have I ever looked at him and thought, Ya Allah, make me just like him? We haven't, which means there's something else in our hearts. Allah is not there. So the mother, she was also focused towards the dunya. So when she saw this guy, she said, Allah, she made a dua. Allahumma ja'al ibni mithlahu. Allah, make my son just like him. But Allah wanted to teach her and us a lesson. So the child stopped suckling. And the child turned around and looked at this guy. And Allah Ta'ala gave the power of speech to the child because Allah Ta'ala, inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir, Allah Ta'ala can do anything. And the child looked at the guy and the child said, Allahumma la taj'alni mislahu, oh Allah, please don't make me like this guy. And the mother said, why, what's wrong with you? First of all, you're talking, infant child. And then I'm giving you dua. I'm saying a prayer for you and you're rejecting it. The child started feeling again. By and by, an emaciated, thin, black slave girl ran past with tattered clothes and she was bleeding and crying and screaming and a mob was chasing her, throwing stones at her and they were saying, Zanaiti Sarakti, Zanaiti Sarakti, you fornicated. You stole. So this crowd is chasing her and punishing her. So the mother saw this spectacle and she said, Oh, I don't want my son to be like this. So she said, Allahumma la taj'al ibni mithlaha. Allah, please don't make my son like this woman, this wretched woman. 
And the child again stopped sucking, turned around, looked at the woman and said, Allahumma ja'alni mithlaha, Allah, please make me like her. And the mother said, Wa'ihak, what's wrong with you? So the child said, that first person, he looks the part, he's got the bling, he's got everything. But he is disobedient to Allah, he is a rebel against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah ta'ala hates him, he is far from Allah. I don't want to be like him. There's a back story that the child had been informed about from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which we tend to dismiss. The back story, we see, see somebody, beautiful trophy wife, nice house, nice car. And we think, Ya Allah, uh, salivating, Ya Allah, maybe just like him. Whoa, 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 bro, you don't know the back story. When was the last time he performed Salat? When was the ta- last time he attended a speech? When was the last time he went out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When was the last time he called out to Allah? When was the last time he adopted the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu You don't see that. In my town, there's one guy who worked very hard, he bought a car, 60 grand. A nice car. And everybody was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then somebody showed me and I said, man, the guy got ripped off. He paid too much for it. And people said, no, no, Masa, you don't know anything about cars. You stick to your two grand Toyota. Masa, you got a good deal. 60 grand car, that's worth more than that. I said, nah, man, the guy, he paid too much for it. He paid too much. He said, nah, 60 grand, look. Masa, he worked hard for it. He deserves it. I said, listen, I hope all the best for him. But you're not looking at the actual price tag. The price tag that you people are seeing is just the apparent one, the 60 grand. But there's a hidden price tag, which we people do not take into account, but we should. What's that price tag? That's a price tag that the accountant doesn't know about. Inland revenue and the tax man don't know about. But you've got to take that t- price tag into consideration. If we're going to die, and if we're going to go into the Akhirah. So, what's what price tag? I said, how many salat, how many namaz did he miss to earn the money to buy the car. You got to take that into account as well. How many commands of Allah did he violate in order to acquire the car? You got to take that into consideration. How much has he been absent from the masjid, from the path of Allah, from the ilm halqas, in order to acquire the car? Think about that. Don't just start salivating, Qath me, ya Allah, ya Allah. Stop, think. I, I wish him all the best. But what has, how, how much of his akhirat has he sacrificed for that car? Because that car he's going to leave behind. The day I die, my car will still be parked outside my house. My bank balance will still be there. My orthopedic mattress and my leather reclining sofas will still be there. Dasta nesti ki me The poet says, and he's talking not about himself only. Talking about me. And don't get too happy, he's talking about you as well. He says, Dasta nesti ki me tume sunarao. Let me tell you what will happen or what happened on the day that I die. Log ghar ko a rahe the, mein ghar se ja raha tha. The people who come into my house to pay their respects, to flush their phones and their cars. That's what it really is, isn't it? Come on, let's not be around. I don't know about Leicester Sharif. Yeah? But in other places you go, and you know, people are, get, oh yeah, grab the tasbih because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, grab the sipara. Yeah? Everyone seems to have a zoo. I'm just saying. And everyone's like, subhanallah, subhanallah, ilah, 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 ilah. What phone have you got, bro? <laughs> don't see you around much, bro. Are you? Are you investing somewhere? What business have you got? Mashallah, doing well, huh? Can you get me in there? This is what happens in Janazas. That's the truth. Sometimes, you know what's happened in our place is a person has died all of a sudden. Two weeks ago, one person, Allah Ta'ala, went in Jannah, involved a 43 year old, just died. <coughs> Suddenly, went to sleep, never woke up. There are many cases like that. So people, you know, then when you feel that, and he's left little kids, and think, you feel really bad. And then you're reluctant to go to the house because you think that, man, this has come as such a shock to me. Imagine how much of a shock it is to his parents. 
was still alive and his wife. Man, and the Abbas in fear is going to be so tense. I don't know what to say, I don't have words. What am I going to do? So you get other people ready. You don't want to go on your own. To make it easy, you get two, two three people ready. Let's go, come on. And then you walk in, a laugh a bit. Sometimes you walk in, first thing you hear is laughter. People, the girls are in the back and the boys are in the passage and then, can you pass some orders me? And how are you going on? Jalo, jalo, nam goes, jalo, come on, come in the back room, eat, eat. And all this, and you think, what? And then you go and sit with the man, and then one guy is like, to another guy. And some guys talking about Dubai. And some guy, yeah, yeah, what's with the sun time? Just come from, back from Turkey. Yeah, yeah, where did you go for your Turkish bath and all that? And you see it there, you think, Allah. So that's why the poet says, Dasta next sticky met me Let me tell you what will happen on the day that you die. People will come to your house. People will come to my house. And I'll be leaving my house. And people will be sitting on my leather reclining sofas. And people will be using my central heating. And people will be using my cushions and putting their feet up. And the people who have come from far, they say, yeah? So they'll, they'll be eating on my dastakhan, eating my food. Because rice was half price in Tesco. So I stopped up thinking, ah, oh, this will keep me going for a year. Not realizing that my days are numbered. There was a tail sale on. So I went and bought loads of tail, loads of oil. I thought this will keep me going till Ramadan. But I didn't realize that I'm not going to keep going till Ramadan. So people will come and sit in my house, sit on my leather recliner sofa, use my radiator, eat my food. The worst thing, brothers, is that they talk about themselves. They won't even talk about me. That's a reality of what's going on today. We are st stooped. So much gaflat, neg negligence, forgotten the akhirat, that even when we go to the Qabristan. One time I went to this one place, somebody had passed away, so I prayed the Salat, Janazah Salat in the Masjid, and I quickly came out, and I jumped in the car, and I took the back route to the Qabristan to avoid the traffic, and I got there early. And the grave diggers had arrived there, and so I started making my way to the grave, Next thing I hear laughter in the Qabristan, ha ah, he, he. And I approached and the guys who were standing on the grave were having a laugh. And then I heard, I saw some smoke rising. And some guy was vaping on the cover. Some guy was smoking on the cover. Allah Akbar. In the Qabristan, if you're not going to remember death, if you're not going to remember that one day I'm going to be in this hole, and if it's a night like this, People are going to put me into a dark, cold, wet hot hole in the ground and within days they'll be flooded with water. And they'll be, you scared of spiders? Forget spiders, you don't have to worry about spiders when you go in the grave. There'll be centipedes and wood lice and massive spiders crawling all over your body. That six pack, within a few days is going to disintegrate and your muscle is going to dissolve away and it's going to become the food of insects. You should be worried about that. But in the Qabristan, a person laughing away, ha ah, ha And if you go and stand on the sides when they're lowering the person in the grave, people are in their groups, they're talking, what are they talking about? Talking about dunya. This is how far we've come. But the reality is, there's no denying death. We're all going to die, we're all going to go in the grave. And death can come to us at any time. Rasulullah said, the grave calls out every day. Every day my and your grave is calling out to us. Every single wherever my grave is, is calling out. Why? Have I heard it? No. How do I know? Because the most truthful Rasulullah has informed us. Whatever he said, Gufta O Gufta E Allah Wad, Garji Az Kurbume Allah Wad. Words were Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they were inspired by Allah. So there is no one more truthful, Woman Astaqumin Allah Hitila, than Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. 
And in the humans, there's no one more truthful than Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He is informing us, not because Allah Taala has informed him only, but Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is informing us of the grave and the afterlife because he was also shown many of the spectacles of the hereafter. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says on one occasion, Jibreel Islam and Mikael Islam took me. And I was shown certain spectacles in the barzakh. The barzakh is the place where you and I are going to go when we die and before we're resurrected, known as the barzakh. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, in the barzakh I saw one person was lying down. An angel was standing over him, carrying a huge, heavy boulder, rock. And the angel brought it down on the person's head with such force that it completely smashed the person's head, and with such force that the boulder bounced away, and the person's head was splat. Fragments of his brain and skull splattered everywhere. And the angel went to fetch the boulder, and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, by the time the angel had returned. Allah Taala had restored the person's head back to normal, and the angel again brought the boulder down on his head, and the same thing happened. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he saw this spectacle, he was so traumatized by it. Can you imagine that happening? He asked the angels, "Who is this? Why this punishment?" Eventually, he was told that this is a person who did not pray his Isha Salat and went to sleep. Think about that, brothers. A person doesn't perform his Isha Salat, goes to sleep. He thinks he's had the best sleep. And the Muslim in summer who stays awake for Isha Salat, he's got to stay awake till eleven o'clock. Nah, man, I've got to go work tomorrow. I'll go to sleep at nine o'clock. What about your Isha Salat? Oh no, no, you know. Don't you judge me. My Allah understands. <laughs> and he's got a nice long sleep. He enjoyed the sleep. But the consequence is coming. Why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam informed us. These things, brothers, are a reality. But we people are acting like Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam never uttered these words. Why? Because we're so stupid and saturated in the dunya. Ji esa lagaya jine mein marne ko musalman bhul gaya. Our heads, you know, like they say, your heads in the sun. Our heads are in the dunya. Stuck, and we're completely oblivious to the akhirah. We'll come across a grave, we'll come across a janaza, and we'll feel nothing. We won't even be reminded that I one day will be carried like this. We see a name written on the masjid board, and we have no contemplation that one day my name will definitely be written on this board as well. Even if I die somewhere else in my local masjid, the name will be written there. And after a day or two, my name will be wiped off, and there will be no sign of my name written there. No one will be able to tell that my name was written there. And the reality is, my memory, just as my name was wiped out, within days and weeks, my memory will be erased from the earth also, like I never even existed. That is the reality of the dunya, brothers. And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that the grave is calling out to us. And if it's a day like this, people will come and sit on my in my house, leather reclining sofa, central heating cushions, and they won't even give me one cushion. That's a treachery of the dunya. The guests who come from far, they'll sleep on my leather recline, my orthopedic mattress, and they won't give me any mattress. I'll be in the cold, wet hole in the ground, completely alone, pitch black. You're scared of the black. You're scared of the darkness of the dunya. Take out your phone, get the light on. There, anabai tu dhulma, complete darkness, insects, <coughs> terror. And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam goes on to describe that the people who have buried us will not have left the graveyard yet. You and I will still be able to hear their footsteps, and in the meantime, we'll hear a rumbling and a shaking, tremor. And 
رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أقبر الميت أتاه ملكان أسودان أزرقان The people burying us will have not left the graveyard will be hearing their footsteps and two angels will come to each and every single one of us Rasulullah sallallahu describes his angels Rest assured brothers I might not make it to tomorrow morning next new year's evening whether you make it I make it I don't know it's not certain but it's guaranteed that this angel these angels that I'm talking about you're going to see them I'm going to see them we're all going to see them Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said they've got terrifying hideous features they're completely black from head to toe and their eyes are blue like lightning يحفران الارض بانيابهما ويتعان في اشعارهما اعينهما كالبرق الخاطف واصواتهما كالراد القاصف their hair comes right down to the ground they will be trampling their own hair they have teeth which are like the horns of rams which come down to the ground and they will split the earth between themselves and me by means of these teeth معهما مرزبا من حديد لو ضرب بها جبل لصار ترابا each one of them will be carrying a hammer so heavy that if a mountain was struck with one of these sledge hammers the mountain would turn to dust you and i are going to see this and they will sit us up and a person will be terrified and they meant to be terrifying and their voice is like thunder scare a person and then we will be asking questions first questions mar rabbu who is your lord we all know the answer um, I, when i was a kid i used to think a person can only say my rabb is allah or buddha or ganesh or jesus yes but as i've gone through the journey of life i've understood and i've heard so many people say so many things <coughs> football is my lord football is my religion money is my one person he goes my body is a temple because he's a gym boy he deserves to be worshiped i was once traveling on a train the golden temple and I was on my own and these lads gone and they were drinking and I got really scared <coughs> and so I climbed up to the top berth and they were singing playing a guitar and drinking and then eventually they spotted me and they oh mon mi aaj 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 come down I said no man so poor so now we had this conversation so they turned out to be nice guys they were all Sikh and they asked me they goes that what is your religion so i said i'm a muslim islam so one of them goes that no he goes what's your yeah who's your lord so i said allah so then one of them goes that you know somebody's god is his wife he had his eye on her his day one when i first set eyes on her my heart just went garden garden <laughs> bad bad hua something changed inside I felt something strong i knew i had to get her sometimes people come to me and they tell you what's up please i know you're going to make do i get married to her she's the only one bro come on i'll make do i like you the best no 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 sir listen i'll make do i like you the best one for you no 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 sir i know the best one for me she is the one Bro, I made dua that you get the best one. No, no, she's the one. I said you don't know. I said what? What's that? No. I said you don't know. It might be. By her say they cut to who's the hazin. Under say they cut to big raw machine. It might be, and it happens in many cases. Many boys, many girls come to us. Say, sir, Malaysia, cast, cast man. 
I thought that he's Mr. Right. I dated him for six years. I thought he's the right guy. We got married. Turned up to be someone else. He's narcissistic. He's abusive. This one. Some guys, many guys, they come because the boss. I thought she's so beautiful, most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I got married to her. Turned out to be the ugliest thing I've ever known. It's beautiful from the outside. But I realize that even that takes hours. <laughs> She's just good at art. When she was a little girl, she was good at watercolor. And now she's good at painting her face. But when I got to know her, or him, turned out to be the ugliest person from inside. So a person is said, no, that's the one for me. Pray for that. I only want that. No, you don't know. Allah knows what's right for you. So, what do you want to do? I'll be like, I'll be like, I'll be like, Six or three. Six or three. So the guy goes up. Somebody's, somebody's God is his wife. He worships her. He goes, somebody's God is their money. He worships money. And somebody's is Christianity, somebody's is Islam. So then he stops. So I goes, yeah, okay, so what's yours? Because I didn't know if they're Hindus or Sikh. Well, so the guy, he held up the whiskey bottle. He goes, Hamara Khuda, bottle. Hai. <laughs> <laughs> My God is a bottle. People say stuff like that. What is a God? A God is something or someone, an entity that you sacrifice your desires for, your sleep for, your food for. We need to ask ourselves, who do I sacrifice or what do I sacrifice? Is my job, my rub, my shop, my football, my hobbies, my mates? Hayya ala salah, hayya ala al is being called and I can't be bothered. But one friend sends one message. Let's go for a steak. Nobody says, I've already eaten. Say, go on, I can squeeze one on, go on then. Mother said, Allah, I just cook for you. I just, you just cane six rotis. But there's always room for, for the mates. So the first question we will be asked, who is your Lord? We need to ask ourselves, brothers, what have I instilled in my heart? One elder said beautifully, you know the cash register that we have, that you put your money in, in Urdu and in Gujarati other languages, known as Galla, Gallo. So he said, if a person does not make the effort of Iman whilst he's in this world, and he's just crazy, cash is king, crazy for the dunya, chasing dunya, and working all hours, crazy hours, till silly o'clock, trying to make money, and when his cash register is brimming with notes, that makes him happy. And when it's empty, that makes him sad. Performing salat, gaining knowledge, Sending Salat on Rasulullah sallallahu doesn't make him happy. The cash register brimming makes him happy. Missing Salat does not make him sad. The cash register emptying makes him sad. The galla emptying. If that is the case, if that is the condition of a person and he lives his life, he squanders his life chasing money, then when he goes in the grave, the correct answer to the question, Mar Rabbu who is your Lord, is Rabbi Allah. But that person, that wretched person will say, Rabbi Galla. My cash register was my God. I don't know anything else. This is a reality, brothers. It's going to happen to all of us. How am I going to answer those questions? Second question, Madinuk, what is your religion? And as I've already mentioned, some people's religions, they say it openly. My religion is football. My religion is making money. My religion is making, acquiring as many properties as possible. My religion is partying. Life's a melody. Eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow you may die. Just enjoy yourself. You only live once. And if you look at the slogans of the dunya, if you ponder upon them, that's all the world is about now. I'm loving it. You can't beat the feeling. Just do it. 
What's behind all of that? It's all pleasure seeking. Live for now. Just do it. What does that mean? It doesn't matter, matter if she becomes pregnant. It doesn't matter if your mother finds out and her heart is shattered into a thousand pieces and she can't sleep at night. Don't worry about the consequences. Just do it. You can't beat the feeling. I'm loving it. Say, Saad, are you with us? This is what the dunya is now. I was in Jamaat last year and the brothers decided to treat themselves. I don't know why, I don't know what we've done. Let's treat ourselves, what's our come on. So they ordered <coughs> waffles and shakes and all this sort of stuff. So they invited me, come on, what's our come on. So they insisted, so I had a milk. So afterwards, they threw the bags away. So they ordered from this particular place. I'm not very familiar with these brands and everything. The next morning after Fajr, I asked Amir Sahib, I said, can I go for a cup of tea? So I had my, made a cup of tea and I sat down. And the bin was there and the bags were there. And the carters were all there. And the slogan for that company was there. And my, I was drinking tea and my eyes fell on it. And I thought, in la this was a slogan for a company that sells waffles and milkshakes. You know what the slogan was? Or the motto was, nobody needs to know. Allah. Do whatever you want, nobody needs to know. You only live once, nobody's watching you. This is what is behind the slogans of the world. And we have been duped, we've fallen for it. We're living for the here and now. We're just chasing our desires not worrying about consequences. And the Sahaba Kiram also had a slogan. Allah Akbar. Check that out. The Sahaba Kiram also had a slogan. And you know when their slogan, when their motto came out? It came out when they were in dire straits. When they were half naked and the wind was, and the cold was cutting into them. And they were starving. And they had stones tied to their bellies. And there was fear and their houses were unguarded and they feared the enemy coming and killing them and pillaging their houses and killing their children's wives. In, though, in that situation, extreme cold, extreme want, extreme poverty, extreme hunger, extreme fear. At that time, when a person's cut down to the bare bones, that's, what, that's when it comes out, what's inside. That's why sometimes it happens, you go, with somebody you think, oh, he's a top guy. Then you travel with him and then when he gets tough, then he shows his true colors. Then you realize, like, whoa. So Sahaba Kiram was stripped down to the bare basics. And that's when the inner voice came out. And what did they say? They didn't say like us, ooh, I could kill a gourmet burger. Where are we going next? You know, these lads groups, and you all know, I mean, am I, not that old, Alhamdulillah. Yeah? I know, all the lads, they have a group. So, you know, they send jokes and all that. Then every now and then, one person will be conscientious. He goes, you know, Hazrat Mawlana Zakaria Sahib is delivering a bayan today. Send a post on there. So the other guys feel a bit guilty. Say, yeah, uh, Amin, Amin, Amin. Yeah, let's make it. Then uh, we've got to go down. Then the next message comes from one of, the, one of those guys. Where are we going next? This is what happens on the groups. You guys are looking at me like, you guys don't do that. Where are we going next? What does that mean? Meaning after the bayan, still got to go and treat ourselves. Got to go for a milkshake, a smoothie, a gourmet burger. I've never had a gourmet burger, alhamdulillah. But when somebody sent me a picture back years ago when they first came out, Send me a massive picture, I go, check this mother out. <laughs> so I goes, I goes, what's that? I goes, what's that? It's a gourmet burger. I said, what's a gourmet burger? I said, well, I said, you gotta try it. It's got chicken, it's got beef, it's got this and that. It's mashing. So I looked at it, zoomed in a bit, and it's got a skewer going through, isn't it? Gourmet burgers have a skewer going through, a stick going through. So I said, what's a skewer for? What's that? It's so big so heavy that you have to put a stick through it, otherwise it topples over. To keep it upright, you have to have a stick through it. 
why I said to him, I go, son, you eat too many of them, pretty soon you're going to need a steak to stop you from toppling over. It's not good for you, this stuff. But this is what Muslims have become now. Curry houses, go maybe picnic party, ha ha, he he, holiday. Living our lives like it's a big party. Enjoy yourself. So somebody, you know, sent on the group, where are we going next? So people are saying, oh, not had a steak for ages, no, let's go for a smoothie this side of thing. I go, boy, the answer to that, where are we going next? We're going out in the path of Allah. Where do you think we're going? We're going to the masjid after that. We're going to perform the hajj. We're going to strive for the deed. What do you mean where are we are going to go? We're not going back to the stinky dunya. We've just come from now. But our, our mottos have become this. Obey your thirst. What's your thirst? Your desires. Just do it. I'm loving it. You can't beat the feeling. Nobody needs to know. And then I was in one place, Allah Akbar. This is going back about five years. It was an ice cream advert. And it was a two flavored ice cream. And underneath that, it said, unleash the beast. Ice cream. I was telling you to do? take the shaitan out of you. Unleash the beast. And then under that, Bolana, Allah Akbar. He said, you know what he said? Dare to go double. <laughs> Dare to go double. I'm not going to desecrate the masjid and the member of Rasulullah by explaining that. If you know, if you understand that, you understand that. That's disgusting, vulgar. It's just an ice cream advert. Somebody said to me, Mosab, you're reading into it too much. I said, okay, maybe that one. But what about, how do you explain, just do it and I'm loving it and this and that. All of them. It's all about the here and now. Enjoy yourself. There's no afterlife. Life's a party. Eat, drink and be merry. Tomorrow you may die. At least he died. You know, people write on the thing, isn't it? When somebody dies, he was scuba diving, he was skydiving. And his parachute, he only did it once in his life. His parachute did not open. Never did it again. And, you know, or doing some extreme sport. So, you know, people say, oh, well, at least he died doing what he loved. So I wrote in the comments, I bet he didn't like the love, the, I bet he didn't love the dying part. <laughs> yeah, Allah, what do you, how can you say that? At least he died doing what he loved. What? What about the accountability of the hereafter? The fact that we're all going to stand in front of Allah. The fact that we're all going to face these two angels. And if a person cannot answer satisfactorily, Rasulullah said, if he has not made an effort to bring Allah into his heart, and in his heart he's got gourmet burgers, and holidays, and holiday resorts, and Bugattis, and cars, and bling, and money, then he'll say, ha ha, ladri, I don't know, I don't know. And then they ask him, what's your religion? But he didn't devote himself to his religion. He was an ambassador of the deen of Allah. It didn't hurt him. The fact that he lived in a Muslim area. And from Monday to Friday, whenever he walked the streets to go for Fajr Salat, Allah gave him the tawfiq. And he would walk all these houses, every single house, a Muslim house, and he would find the lights on in the morning. Why? Because they're going to work. But come Saturday, all the lights are off. And nobody's performing Fajr Salat. And it didn't pain him. Are you not the follower of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Is that not supposed to pain you? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw the bia, the funeral procession of a Jew. And he started crying. And the Sahaba came up and said, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was our Muslim. He was a one of yours. He wasn't your companion. Why are you crying? He said, I know he's not one of my companions. Alaysa bin Nafs, was he not a human being? And he's gone without Iman? What's going to happen to him in the Akhirah? <coughs> Is he not going to face Munkar Naqib? Is he not going to have to stand in front of Allah and give an account for the life of the for, for this life? Is he not going to have to pass over the bridge of Sirat? Is he not going to burn in the hellfire forever and ever? And are we not supposed to feel the same pain when we see our brethren? Our own brothers and sisters, family members, and our mates doing the wrong things. And it doesn't hurt us. We're happy. Alhamdulillah, I pray I'm not like him. I perform my salah. Alhamdulillah. 
Oh, about the Ummah, what about all of these mankind who are going towards the hellfire? We had come to save them. But we're so busy in our gourmet burgers and weddings and curry houses and outings and holidays. We don't have time for our own akhirat. Extending and decorating our houses and then giving Monisab a guided tour. What, are you going to give me a guided tour of your three bedroom house? Have some shame, Besharam. Come on, come on, come on, I'll show you. What's up, you see this? This is Scandinavian time, what's up? They're not going to get used to a proper stuff, this. Yeah. What's up, you see these lights? Went to one guy's house in a posh area. And before he moved in, it was a beautiful bungalow. Yeah. Long lawn at the front and back. An old English couple <laughs> lived there. My man bought it, first thing he did, tarmacked it over. Yeah. And then he renovated it and took me in. He's got a jewel in the living room, silver one, with a step, massive one, one of those swings. Muslim, check it out, what do you think? Yeah. Oh man, there's no accounting for taste. One guy he put lights in his curving board all the way around. He said, Muslim, you know these, they flash and they change color. Shall turn them on, please don't. And I bought my shades with me. That's what we're running to. Dunya, dunya, dunya. Ghar ko to jannat bana liya. Jannat ne ghar nahi banaya. You made your house into Jannat, but you've not made a house for yourself in Jannat. What about the Akhirat? And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said, if a person cannot answer satisfactorily to these three questions. Third question, shown Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and told, asked, who is this person? But a person who did not live the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will not be able to recognize. And he will say, ha ha la adri, I don't know. So the angels will use those hammers on that person and let Allah save his own. And one strike will send him flying 70 feet into the ground. And he will feel more pain than all the accumulated pain in, that exists in the world at any one time. Somebody right now in the world is breaking a leg, breaking an arm, having a child, getting burned alive. All of that pain rolling into one. More than that is a pain of one strike. Allah Ta'ala save us all. And yet we live our lives as if Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't even mention these things. Ask ourselves, I ask myself, you ask yourself. When was the last time I thought about my Qabr? About Akhirat, about Jannah, Jahannam. If a person is striving in the path of Allah, going in Tabligh, going in Jamaat, then he's doing it. Or he's going to Ilm Majlis, gaining knowledge or he's in Madrasa. But if a person is not doing that, even though he's performing Salat, but he's not sitting in the Ta'aleem, and not doing, performing the Ta'aleem in the home, then weeks or months or years have gone by when the person has not even thought about Qabr and Akhirah. When in fact we were supposed to about, uh, think about these things all the time. And because we'd be thinking about them, we're supposed to be preparing about, for them all the time. But because we're not thinking, in English we say out of sight, out of mind. Because these things are out of our psyche, therefore we're not even preparing for it. So this is why brothers, these talks take place, we come together, so that a revolution takes place in our lives. So that then we become those fortunate people that when the Munkar Nakir come to us and sit us up in one riwayat, it says, Allah, Allah make me and you all of you. Allah Ta'ala make me one of those persons. And Allah Ta'ala make all of you one of those persons. The second Amin was louder than the first one. What you got against me? Come on, brother. May Allah make me one of those persons. Amin. May Allah Ta'ala make each and every one of you one of those persons. Amen. About whom Rasulullah has mentioned that that person will die, he or she will go six foot under, but because their roof came out of their body like a droplet of water coming out of a tap. How much screeching does that make when a droplet of water comes out of a tap? Is there any sound? Scraping, screeching, nothing. Delicately, it just comes out. Or if you have a bowl of flour and you have a hair in there, pulling that out, effortless. 
So mu'min, mu'mina, a person who lived a good, clean, pure life, who did not make these murder slogans, just do it, I'm loving it, you can't beat the feeling, dare to go double, did not make those slogans, their slogans and their mottos. Instead, he or she made the slogan and the motto of the Sahaba Kiram his motto. And what was the motto of the Sahaba Kiram? When they were stripped down to the bare basics, the inner voice came out and they screamed out. They said, Allahumma la aisha illa aisha Oh Allah, this life is no life. The real life is the life of the hereafter. I'm living for the hereafter. I'm going to go into Jannah. I'm going to be chilling with my hoors, my quarter of a million hoors. Smile. At this point, you're supposed to smile the less. I'm kind of worried about smiling, you guys. Quarter of a million hoors, a person who dies in the path of Allah. Quarter of a million hoors. Rasulullah said, in Jannah, a person will be given the strength of a hundred men in eating, drinking, and joining the dance. And a person will go to his virgin hood and he will engage with her for 40 years. Urban Ataraba, Allah Ta'ala describes them. Ataraba means that they are very play playful. The ulama Kiram, one interpretation says, she'll know which buttons to press. She'll know how to play with him. 40 years he will engage with her and when he leaves her, he turns away. When he looks back, she will have become 70 times more beautiful and she'll have become a virgin again. You're supposed to get excited, brothers, at this point. The Sahaba Kiram, because they were people of Akhirat and because they were living for the Akhirat, these things would excite them more than a sale or a discount or a gourmet burger or an outing excites us. We talk about dunya, everyone starts smiling. Everyone starts getting happy. When I talk about gourmet burgers, people got massive smiles. I'm not giving you one. You're not eating one now, bro. What are you smiling for? We talk about jinnah, nothing. Why? Because we're so distant from it. In Ramzan, I was doing a bayan, started talking about Jannah. About five minutes into Jannah, I'm like, I'm really like miserable. So I goes, come on brother, I have to like, come on brother, what's wrong with you? Huh? I said, smile at least, say subhanAllah brothers, I'm talking about Jannah. One guy after the Muhammad said, I'm going to say subhanAllah, I'm starving because I'm going to say subhanAllah. I can't say subhanAllah, I was dying, Ramzan, long brother. The next time when I did a bayan, I said, come on brother, smile. Don't think about the kebab. Think about the sawab. Think about the reward you're going to get. Think about Jannat. One sahabi came to Rasulullah sallallahu Ya Rasulullah sallallahu sifli al Jannah. Describe Jannat for me. Rasulullah sallallahu started describing. I'm not going to go into all the details because we don't have enough time. Eventually, he started getting more and more ecstatic and excited. And his smiles turn into subhanallahs, subhanallahs turn into laughter. He's hearing more and more and more. He's jumping around until eventually he gave a scream and he dropped dead. Rasulullah said the anticipation and the excitement of Jannah has killed your brother. Because they were so attached to it. It's as if they were seeing it with their own eyes. Why? Allahumma la aisha illa aisha akhirah. That was their slogan, that was their motto, that's what they lived by. And they were always looking forward to and always preparing for the Akhirat and always working towards the Akhirat. You and I, brothers, need to ask ourselves, honestly speaking, obviously we can all lie and say, MashaAllah, at least I came for the Bayan, uh, Saturday night, uh, New Year's Eve, come on, what more do you want? It's not what I want, it's what Allah wants for me. It's what Rasulullah wants. And they want a lot more than that. We judge by our standards. My friend is a druggy, at least I play my namaz, alhamdulillah, Allah shukar. Yeah, it is Allah shukar, but you're nowhere near where you're supposed to be. You need, you need to be doing a lot more. So when we will live the 
good, clean, pure life and make the effort and make Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al akhirah our motto, <coughs> then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa described this one particular person. May Allah Ta'ala make you and me and all of us of those people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, a person will be, a per- certain pe- people will be placed in the grave and the people burying them will still be in the graveyard and Munkar Naki will come upon the person and they will ask the person, they will sit him up and they, his coffin will slide down to his waist. They will say to him, Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord? Now this person lived such a good life, he never missed his salat, his namaz. So at that time in the grave, when you set up the ambience of the grave, it won't be completely dark, it won't be completely light. It will be as it is in the dunya just before Maghrib Salah, getting dark. So the person, because his ruh came out of his body like a droplet coming out of a tub, he's forgotten that he's died and he's gone six foot under. He's forgotten that he was on the slab and people were bathing him. And he'll just look and the, he, the terrifying features of the angels won't even scare him because he was only scared of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he lived the life. And so he will say to them, he'll just look around and say, hang on, whoa, forget your questions. I've not prayed my Asar namaz. And the sun's about to go down. Let me perform my Asar salat. Allah Akbar. Then I'll answer your questions. The angels will turn to each other and say, there you go, we've got our answers. A person who's died, been bathed, shrouded, gone six foot under, been in the hospital freezer for half a day. After that, he's still not forgotten his salat. What more can we ask this person? So the angels will leave that person and say, go back to sleep. You've died now, there's no salat for you. He said, have I died? He said, yeah, there's no salat for you. Fafrishuhu min al jannah. The announcement will be made. Bring down for this person the bedding of jannah. Not the orthopedic mattress memory form of the dunya. The mattress of jannah. Well be suhu min al jannah. Take away his coffin, his kati, bosky, white cloth. Take that away. Bring down for him or her the clothing, the jilbab, or the abaya of jannah. وَفْتَحُوا لَهُ بَابًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Open the doors and windows of Jannah for this person. The angels will not use those hammers on that person as they did for the sinner and for the non-believer. Instead, brother, put your phone away. Brother, brother, don't do that, please. You're going to stop my flow. No, no. I know what people say. Because one person said to me, I'm inviting somebody for your bayan. I said, Jazakallah for the compliment. There's been late for that. Gush was before Isha. One brother was sitting right in front of me, he's on his phone. I said, Kadara, you got cheek. Right in front of me, you're brave, aren't you? You don't know, I'm taking notes from your man. I said, Jazakallah, Jazakallah. I said, have you not heard of pen and paper, man? You're on the phone. Guy sitting at the back might think, man, that guy's texting his bird. Why can't I text man? So don't do that. Anyway, so where were we? They were just getting clad in the clothing of Jannah. And the angels will, instead of using the hammer on that person, <coughs> for the mu'min, mu'mina, for me and you, inshallah, they will use those hammers on the walls of the grave, and the grave will expand to as far as we can see. And 70 or 77 windows of Jannah will be opened up. First of all, a window of Jahannam will be opened, and we'll be told, look up, and we'll look at it, and we'll see the torches and the 70 feet long serpents and the scorpions the size of donkeys and mules and the beating of the angels and the scorching heat of Jahannam and we get terrified and the angels say don't worry, don't worry this is where you're not going you've been saved from this you've done the right thing you had one chance and you used it properly say goodbye to this you're never going there and then the windows of Jannah will be opened up and then they'll say, look here, you look, and they say, this is where you're going. This is your crib. This is your extended house. This is your mansion. At that time, if death were possible, the person would die. His heart would burst. He'll say, let me go, let me go. He said, no, 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 go back to sleep. Then the person will say, he's forgotten, he's died. He said, let me go back to my family. Let me go back to Leicester. Let me tell him that I made it. I'm successful. 
I got my grades. I did it. The angel said, oh, go to sleep. Inshallah, one day you'll meet them. Pray for them that they do the right thing. You're going to be united with them. Go to sleep. And the person who go to sleep, the best and sweetest and deepest sleep will ever have. And no one but Allah will wake us up on the day, even, even if that's 10,000 years after. Nothing to disturb us. These are things that we're supposed to be aspiring for. And so for that we need to make an effort. But because brothers, the environment is such and we've drifted so far, many Muslims, they say, what are you talking about? I'm going to end with this now because my voice is failing me now. And you guys are thinking, man, this guy is like, shut up, come on. Man. Mullah Zakaria says, the man made a mistake, don't invite this guy again, what the hell? He's a microholic. <laughs> but I'm, I only intended to speak for about 20 minutes. But I always say it's not the speaker that speaks. It's the hunger of the brothers that makes the speaker speak. One of our elders who delivered tens of thousands of bayans, you can get volumes and volumes of his bayans. He must have delivered thousands in his lifetime as a tabir there. One time he went on the mimbar, started the khutbah, prayed a Quran ayat, sat there for some time, started the khutbah again, prayed an ayat, stopped again, silence, did that a few times, and then he said, Brothers, nothing's coming in my heart, sorry, I've got nothing to offer today. Alhamdulillah. Such a great scholar, but because he made dua to Allah, you inspire me, Allah. I don't talk, you make me talk. And on that day, for some reason, maybe the congregation was inattentive. So I always say, if somebody says, you did a good bayan, I say, no, you did a good bayan. It's you people that make me speak. So Jazakallah, you've been a wonderful audience. I'm not going to keep you much longer. But I'll give this example because it's a problem of our times. Perhaps, I hope not. I hope none of you were thinking this when I was talking about the Qabr and Akhirat. But Muslims now do think in this manner, Marisa, what are you talking about? Grave, angels, massive, coming with these hammers and then striking the walls and expanding to as far as you can see, 77 windows of Jannah. And on the other side, scorpions the size of donkeys, serpents 70 feet long. What are you talking about? There, there ain't a space for that in the Qabr. The guy's grave is only six by two and the next grave is right next to it. What are you talking about, Marisab? How can that happen? There ain't space for that. But yes, it does happen. And it is happening. Why? Have I seen it? No. The people of the world, you know, have conducted these experiments but because it makes them look bad they don't admit it what is will know you do your research you find them. in people's graves and coffins they put in all sorts of cameras motion sensors and infrared cameras and all that to try to see that what was this Muhammad talking about what is all this punishment in the grave if it's true then we'll start preparing but they didn't find anything why because you can't see with these eyes when you and I will start to die, when our sakarat, the throes of death will start, the angel will come and touch us here. Your eyes will be wide open, but they'll be wide shut. Your eyes will be open, they'll be seeing, but they'll be blind. If you've ever been around a dying person, you witness this. Some people say, Masab, my dad was dying, we brought the whole family. Oh, look, Dada. Say salam to Dada. And he said, Dada, look, it's your Munna, Tunna. And he, was he just like looking through us. He wasn't responding. He was still awake. He was still breathing. Bro, his Sakarat had started. The angel had touched him. And so these eyes were open. These eyes were open, but they were closed. They were seeing, but they were blind. Because the angel touched him, he can't see you now. He can't see the hospital bed. He can't see the wall and the door. He can't see the ceiling. Now he's got x-ray vision. Now he can see the angels coming down. Now he can see the other realm which does exist. 
just as we are sitting here now, we're humans, mashallah, many of us here, but more than us, amongst us humans, there might be a few jinns as well. That's why I said fill the space, otherwise you've got one sitting next to you there. And then you wonder where you get nightmares from. Yeah? So there might be a few jinns here, but more than that, more than the human beings and the jinns, there are thousands of times more angels sitting here. How do I know? Have I seen them? No, Rasulullah has informed them. And they're sitting here, fill this whole place, and they're piling on top of each other, reaching the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And right now they're going and they're telling Allah ta'ala that in Leicester, in Masjid Muhammad, such and such is remembering you. So Allah ta'ala is remembering us in the congregation by aid of angels. What a great honor. What can be a great honor than that? So, when we, when the death falls upon a person, then vision changes. That's why some people who have not made a preparation, who dismissed it all. There's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no angels, they're all fairy tales. What are you talking about, about Mozart? The grave is, the next grave is next door. There's no room for all of that. When they denied everything, then when the angel touches them, and the actually vision opens up, and the angels start coming down, then the person, he, because what happens when you get a shock? Many people die like that. In a state of shock, frozen, face is frozen. Why? Because they didn't expect all this. What's all this? They thought there's no afterlife. You die, you die. It's a long sleep. You never wake up. And all of a sudden, that's not to say, brothers, footnote, you might be around a naked person and he might die like that as well. You know why that is? Because they were only expecting 500 angels to come down for them. As Rasulullah mentioned in the hadith. But when Rasulullah mentions these things, he's talking about the common Muslim. When he's talking about Jannah, he's talking about the lowest Jannah. But there have been incidents where Rasulullah and the four Khulafai Rashidin and the Sahaba Kiram and 70,000 angels have come down to collect the rule of a person. That's why the person gets shocked. Jinnah is shown to the person. In one hadith, in fact, in quite a few hadiths is mentioned a person who gets in the habit of reciting Salat on Nabi Duru Sharif a thousand times every day. Allah grant me Tawfiq and all of you brothers Tawfiq also. In the second one, we will still love what you call. And one hadith is even easier. A person who, perform, who recites thousand Duru Salat on Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every Friday, not every day. So ideally we should do it every day. If not, we should aim to do it on a Friday. And Guru Sharif is very easy, short, was Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the riwayat, in the in narrations is mentioned, a person who is in the habit of doing that, then he or she will not die except that they will see their palace in Jannah whilst they are still alive in this world. Just at the last moments, boom, opens up. The family is crying, don't go, don't grow. And he's saying, hey, forget that, I'm off, see you later. Uh, who's the dancing, calling him. But his daughter and his wife say, don't go, don't go. And he said, nah, man, I'm out of here. Allah grant me an order with that kind of death. But there's other death also, brothers. We have to save ourselves. One doctor in a Muslim country, he says, he tells his story, he said, I was once in my house and the God Squad came round, and the Jamaat brothers. And they came and knocked on my door and my pager had just sounded. So I had to attend the patient. So I was rushing out. Just as I opened the door, they were about to knock. Surrounding the brother, we come from the masjid, we're meeting the brothers. So I said, Oh, listen, I'm a doctor, I'm a surgeon, I'm the biggest doctor in the hospital, chief surgeon, I've got to attend to this. Sorry, ain't no time. So as he rushed past them, the one, the particular said, Okay, brother, you shall be staying in the local masjid, we'll be there three days, come along. Uh, the brother at the end, just as he went past him, he said, Doctor Sam, what are you going for? said there's been a car crash and it's critical. So 
So I'm going to save the person, see if I can save him. So the person, the Jamaati brother said, Dr. Saab, make sure he prays the Kalima. So the doctor thought, what an absurd thing to say. He didn't reply, he just thought, the Muslim country, we live in a Muslim country, and the guy is a Muslim. Of course he's going to die with the Kalima. What an absurd, he, at that time, the doctor, because he'd not spent time in the path of Allah, and with the ulama, he didn't know that not every Muslim dies with the kalima. Many Muslims die saying, Bugatti, Bugatti. Many Muslims die, Allah forbid, thinking, money, money, my job, my wife. Allah forbid, how we have lived our lives, what we have uttered all our lives, that's what comes out. So he said, make sure you praise the kalima. I just dismissed it because I got to the side and the person lost half his body, he was bleeding to death. So I said to him, you know, I told, tried to tell him that, you know, your situation is critical and all this sort of stuff. And the guy's got blood coming out of his mouth because, my mobile, my mobile, my mobile, my mobile, it's my mobile. And I'm trying to explain to him that, bro, you're about to go. Then I remember what the Jamaat guy said. I thought, man, this guy's supposed to be praying the Kalima. I told him he's dying. And he goes, I told him blatantly then. I said, brother, you've got minutes, you're dying. So the guy said, my mobile, my mobile. So he goes, I was shocked. Then I said, pray kalima, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. And that guy said, my mobile, my mobile, where is it? It's mobile. And he goes, the guy died saying, mobile, mobile. And he didn't utter the kalima. The doctor sahab said, I was shocked, no end. What is this? So he goes, then the next day I made time and I went for the jamal. In a local masjid, I sat with him, I asked him, I said, why did you say that to me? Why do you say make sure you praise the kalima? We live in a Muslim country, or oh, everyone's a Muslim. So then they explain that, yeah, but wow. how you have lived your life, that's how you die, that's how you'll be resurrected. What have you filled in your heart? That's what matters, and that's what's going to come out. So he goes, I've never heard that before. It struck my heart. So he goes, then I decided to conduct an experiment of my own. He said, I went back to my hospital because I was the chief surgeon, the main guy. I told all the doctors and nurses, all the wards, if somebody is dying in our hospital, you call me anytime, day or night. And obviously, I would always be summoned for the car crashes and stuff like that. Because within a short time, I witnessed 150 people dying. And I kept a record. And I attended. And I saw people dying. And I did Talqeen of Kalima to them. And it was from 150 people, Muslims in a Muslim country, only two died reciting the Kalima. <coughs> Both of them had beards and I made inquiries and both of them were spending, one of them was actively engaged in tabligh, the other one had spent time and he was a Hafiz of Quran. Other than that, <clears throat> and it was that struck my heart because I left my practice and I thought what's gonna, I was worried about myself, who am I gonna utter? And I went to the elders and I said, anytime, any country, anywhere you wanna send me, I give my whole life to the Deen of Allah, to Tabligh, send me. And he cut back from the dunya and he started making it. And then he wrote a book. I've got the book in which he details all of this. So brothers, this is the reality. How am I going to die? How am I going to fare in the Akhirah? Whether I understand it or not, it's a reality. The next grave might be next door. The grave might be very small. There's not room for scorpions and angels and all that, but it's all going to happen. It's all happening right now. You know, I always say, a graveyard should be a dog's paradise, isn't it? What does a dog love to do? Dig up bones. So common sense says, a graveyard should be a dog's paradise, isn't it? Endless supply of bones. And yet, you go to Leicester, Sharif, Kabristan, or Bolton, Kabristan, any Kabristan, and there'll be a massive sign, no pets allowed, no dogs allowed, pets must be on the lead. Why? Because people that take their pets into the Kabristan, more often than not, they find that the animal goes completely berserk. One English person was saying, I always took my dog for a walk, then there was some roadworks going on 
So I had to drive, walk on the other side of the road, which was next to the graveyard. I don't know what happened to my dog. He just went completely chasing his own tail and jumping around, <coughs> barking and howling. And all. I don't know what happened to him. And then I got past the graveyard. He was okay after a bit. What happened? Rasulullah said, when the angel strike that person, everyone hears the crushing of that hammer on that person and the screaming of that person is heard in the east and the west all the creation of Allah except the ins and insects except the jinn, the hearers a wildlife program you must have seen animals just grazing all of a sudden there's no leopard or anything around they just go why? you see in, on our houses sometimes pigeons sit in there no car door has been slammed or anything. All of a sudden, they, what happened? They heard the screams from the from the grave, beyond the grave, because it's a reality. So, Malana Umar Sahib, final example. He gave an example <clears throat> of those people who think that how is it possible for all these things to exist under the ground? It's not actually under the ground. You might put your cameras and all that there. You won't find it there. It's in a different realm. It's in the barzakh. Maulana gave this example. And I heard from Maulana. He said that there was a boy who heard this example from me. And he went and he told this example to his aunt or somebody. Who was a Christian nun. And upon hearing this example, she accepted. So it's a beautiful example. I want you to hear it, listen to it, <coughs> ponder upon it, and go home and share it with our brothers and sisters and our children also. Sit them down tomorrow or tonight and tell them the example. Puts everything into perspective. Maulana used to say the example is that there was a lake and in the lake there were fish. So one day a fisherman went fishing, he got his tackle out, he got a live juicy worm and put it onto the hook and then he cast it, the line. So the line, if you know anything about fishing, that the line is very thin, it can't be seen very easily. The hook is hidden now. And so the worm, because it's still alive and it's just had a massive harpoon go through his body, so it's in extreme pain, so it's wriggling around in the lake and the person that he takes out his newspaper and he sits back waiting for a catch. So a small fish in the lake, he sees the fish, he sees a worm, juicy worm and he thinks, oh my takeaway has arrived. I didn't order this one but hey, nice juicy steaks. So he starts darting towards the worm. So another fish, which is old and wise, he intercepts. He said, Beta, whoa, 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 where are you going? He's like, going for that. Stake out. So the big fish goes, don't you dare go near. Don't even touch you with a barge pole. What are you talking about? So the big fish says, what do you see in there? In that, I see a feast. I see the satiation of my hunger. I see enjoyment and pleasure. I see my salvation in there. The elder fish says, yeah, but it's all an illusion. You can see it, but it's not really there. Behind it is something else, the backstory. What backstory? Like that hadith that I mentioned, the child, I don't know if I finish it. The child, what did he say? I don't want to be like that guy. Why? Because the backstory is that he's ugly. He's the enemy of Allah. He's got the money, he's got the blame. But he disobeys Allah, Allah hates him. And the slave girl, people have falsely accused her of fornicating and stealing. She's not done that. She's a waliya, she's a friend of Allah. I want to be like her. So they, in the same way, this big fish says, there's a back story. He said, what? He said, all you can see is a juicy worm, but behind this worm, there's what you call a hook. And it's very sharp. As soon as you bite into that worm, the hook will become impregnated in your top lip and it'll hurt like crazy and you will pull and tug and that hook is connected to what you call a line and the line leaves our world and goes into another world, another realm 
and that line is connected to a rod and at the end of a rod is a guy who is what you call a human and this human is thousands of times bigger than you and he's got this body and in that body he's got these two arms like tentacles and at the end of them he's got these five five fingers and when you bite into that it'll come into your mouth you will tug when you pull in extreme pain he will know he's got a catch and so he'll reel you in and then he'll grab you with his ten fingers and he'll pull you and he'll throw you into what you call a box and then he'll load you up along with all his tackle into what you call a car and then this world that he will take you into is infinite time, million times bigger than the world we're in and in that world he'll take you home and there you have what you call a slab and he'll throw you down on the slab and then he'll get what you call a knife and he'll sharpen it and then he'll, then he'll get you and then he'll skin you take your skin off you, you'll be in pain if you're still alive and then he'll go cut 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 and he'll chop you into pieces and then he'll get what you call a karai, a wok and then he'll put in there what you call oil and then he'll, he'll light what you call fire underneath it and then the oil will become what you call hot and then when the oil starts spitting and going chan chan then he'll get your pieces and he'll roll them in masala in peri peri masala because he's an Asian fisherman yeah, extra spicy masala and then he'll throw you into the oil and you'll start spitting and sizzling and then in this world there's not just one human being this world that I'm talking about there's billions of them but this guy he's got nine best friends so he'll invite all of them and then they all come and he'll serve you on plates with chutney and with barbecue sauce and then these guys will pick you up between a hundred fingers you'll be picked up and you'll be taken apart and every one of these human beings they've got 32 teeth in their mouth mouths and then between 320 teeth you'll be ground and munched and chewed and your bones will be spat out and you'll be no more and then they'll take your bones and throw them outside and then this thing that you call a cat will come and then make more kachumar of you and bite you and rip you apart and you'll be no more and you'll suffer a terrible agonizing death and you'll be destroyed and the little fish looks at the big fish and says Chacha, will you stop taking your tablets? Come on man there's exaggeration and there's exaggeration come on, fairy tales have to have a limit man what are you talking about? Come on, man. That's just crazy. Like Mullah Mahmoud says, the word for glue, the word for exaggeration is glue in Urdu. So he goes, there's glue and there's super glue. All of that? Super glue. Come on. The small fish, this is just so absurd. Come on. If you wanted to stop me eating this worm, you could have at least explained it in a way that, you know, kind of made some sense. You just got all out. What are you talking about? So now the big fish starts crying and he says, Beta, tu man ya na man. Believe me or you don't believe me. What I've said is 100% accurate and true. So the big small fish says, Okay, show me. Uh uh. Can't show you. If I show you, it'll be too late. Do you understand how this relates to the akhirah? The prophets came and they told us, Rasulullah Sassan came and told us, Without comparing the Ambiya Ikram to anything, it's just an example. They came and told us, there is an afterlife, there are angels, there is Qabr, there are scorpions, there are serpents, there is heaven, there is hell. But we say, show us. If we show you, it's too late. There's no re-entry visa. So the small fish looks at his tears and looks at the passion of this big fish sees that okay cha cha has got something and because the fish must be living in Leicester in 2022 from this new generation okay okay let me do my research then innit show me innit how's it real show me so 
so that big fish said, oh, I can't show you that. Okay, let me do my research. The big fish goes, okay, go do your research. But he says to him that, you know, your research will be limited to this world. And I'm talking about another world. So the small fish he sees the passion of the older fish. He says, okay. So you wait here, I'm going to do my research. Comes back all tired, exhausted after some time. And says, Maulana, to the older fish, he says, I swam, swam the length and breadth, breadth of this lake. I've been right to the bottom, I've been right to the top. I found some rusting bicycles and some boots at the bottom, some tires and stuff. I found seaweeds and stuff. <coughs> you were talking about billions of humans, I didn't even find one. You're talking about a hundred fingers, I didn't find one. You're talking about 320 teeth, I didn't find one. You're talking about knives and chopping boards and karai and fire and oil, I didn't find anything. It's all a lie. It's all fake. So the big fish said, no. Tu man ya man, whether you accept it or not, it's the truth. Okay, show me. Uh-uh, I can't show you. So then the big fish says, small fish says, you know what? I've understood this. I've understood your game. You just don't want me to have fun. And you guys aren't smiling when I said that. But the Maulana said, you are smiling. Because this is what they get from people. Myself, you know what it is? You couldn't get a stunner like me, innit? You couldn't get a babe, innit? You don't want me to have fun, innit? And your appa, you know. There's a reason why she does part innit? <laughs> no, that is that, bro. Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed the ulama more than you will ever know. And more than you will ever be blessed if you don't adopt the deed. This is what people say, Masam, you know, you, you passed it. You don't got pulling power in it. You, you ain't got it, that's why. You don't want me to have fun. This is what the people said to the prophets. You just don't want us to enjoy. Life's a melody, let us enjoy. So the small fish says the same thing. I'm too fast for you. I can get to the world before you. That's why you don't want me to enjoy it. I've seen your house, Marisa, two up, two down. Just because I've got a house with a long lawn, I always say, if you get a house with a long lawn, chances are you have to get a wrong lawn. <laughs> See what I did there, Marisa? Still got it, yeah? Marisa, that's not to say you go to somebody's house and he's got a long lawn, it's a stuff for last stuff you got a mortgage. Many people, Alhamdulillah, they worked all their lives, they saved up, they had money, money in the bank account, money, money in the mattress, under the mattress account, sold a few wingers back home, and they bought a house, Alhamdulillah. But a person comes fresh out of university or never been to university and he's bought a massive thing. Dal mein kuch khala hai bhai, something going on, wagwan. Yeah, something haram, bro. So the small fish says this. So then, the big fish cries again, says, no, big, uh, that's not the reason. Please accept what I'm saying. I beg you, I don't want you to meet that fate. But the small fish says, forget you, Molly talk, dry my hands, that's all you guys all will ever talk about. Jannah, Jahannam, Kabar, Akhirat. Come on, man, chillax, man. And the small fish goes. And he goes with a smile on his face. When he bites into it, he's got a smile on his face. But the smile is frozen forever there. As soon as he bites, he feels the pain, feels the hook, sees the line, sees the rod, sees the human being, the fingers, the tearing, the box, the drive home, the slab, the knives, the masala, the oil, the frying, the humans, the fingers, the biting, the chewing, the spitting out, the cuts, sees it all. But it's too late. Jesse, Kearney, Wesley, Bernie. Na maane to karke de, aur jinnat bhi hai, dozat bhi hai. Na maane to marke de. As you sow, so shall you reap. As you do in this world, that's what you're gonna get in this world and in the akhirat. You sell drugs to somebody's kids and think, Mazhab is raining money here, or it's all good. Ah uh ah, -uh, bro, Allah is blind. How dare you destroy the lives of other people's children? One day. You'll have children also. And Allah is not blind. You left mothers crying when they discovered their kids 
the Hafiz of Quran became a crackhead. The mother cried and she made dua. Wallah, whoever led my son down this path, let him never see any joy. That curse came from the depths of her heart. In the middle of the night, every night. And you think you're going to make it? Doing haram, selling haram, destroying communities, destroying lives. Marisab is raining money here. Uh -uh. It's an illusion. It's only for a short time. As you sow, so shall you reap. If you don't believe, then do it for yourself and find out for yourself in this life. And there is a heaven, there is a hell. If you don't believe, when you die, you'll see it all for yourself. Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, Utba, Shayba, Firaun, Qawun, Haman, Shaddad, they all denied. But now they are the best of believers. They believe fully. But it's too late for them. Rasulullah went to the dead body of Abu Jahal and Ko and said, I have found the promises of Allah to be true as I expected. Have you people also found the promises of Allah or Abu Jahal to be true? But they could not answer. And the Sahaba Kiram said, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu can they hear you? They said, Wallah, they hear me now better than they could hear me when they were alive. And they are seeing now the promises of which I promised and I warned them from Allah. They are seeing it now first hand and experiencing it. But it's too late for them. So respective brothers and elders, one day it will be too late for all of us because we're all going to die. Let us not be those people who go from this world crying, begging, gasping for air, saying, no, no, please don't, I'll, I'll, I'll be a good boy now. Let us be those people who when our time comes, we go gladly and willingly with a smile on our face. The Persian poet says that when you came into this world, everyone was laughing, everyone was happy, everyone was giving out ladoos and mitais or cigars, everyone was celebrating, and the nurses were happy, your mom, your aunties, everyone was happy, your granddad was chuffed. Everyone was rejoicing and you were crying. Oh Muslim, live such a beautiful life that when you leave this world, everyone, even your non-Muslim neighbors, your colleagues, even your enemies are crying. Even the pets inside your house are mourning. Everyone, the whole world is crying and you are rejoicing because you know you're going home to Jannah. Why? Because you made the motto of your life, Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al akhirah. Here comes the Akhirat now for eternal bliss. Allah Ta'ala grant me and all of the Tawfiq. You've been a fantastic audience for this. Allah Ta'ala bless you all, bless your families. And I accept you all and accept me for the service of his deen forever and ever. And Allah Ta'ala bless our Marana for giving me the opportunity. And sincere apologies for taking so much of your time. Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll be heading back to Bolton, so we request inshallah we pray for this again. And uh, what's up? Don't you mind me? Jalakumullah. Allahumma salli wa salli wa ba'ali wa sayyidah wa maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi wa ma'in. Ya Rabbi laka alhamdu kama ya al-baghiri jalali wa jika ba'ali wa sultanik. Allahumma la ala nafsi thalana alayk wa jika ma'ala thalita ala nafsik. Allahumma ahdi ala ala al-masjid. اللهم اهد اهل هذه الحارة اللهم اهد اهل هذه القرية اللهم اهد اهل هذا البلد اللهم اهد اهل هذه الدولة اللهم اهد هذه الحكومة اللهم اهد الناس والجان جميعا اللهم اهد الناس والجان جميعا ويعلنا صلوة المحتدى اللهم احي الدين كله في العالم كله إلى يوم القيامة واستعملنا لهذا اللهم استعملنا ولا تستدلنا اللهم ارزقنا شهادة في سبيلك واجعل موتنا بلد رسولك اللهم ثبتنا على الإيمان وأمتنا على الإيمان وأحشمنا يوم القيامة مع المتقين مع الإيمان اللهم اشفي مرضانا واشفي مرضى المسلمين واغفر موتانا ومرضى المسلمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا على النار ربنا تقبل منا إنك السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك التبع الرحيم آمين 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 برحمة الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله